My guest today is Margareta Wallström, who has a long and very accomplished career as a humanitarian worker responding to crisis in Vietnam, Cambodia and Afghanistan, among many others. She went on to take many leadership roles, serving as United Nations Assistant Secretary General for Disaster Risk Reduction and as head of the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. In 2017, she was also elected as president of the Swedish Red Cross. Margareta, thank you for joining us today. Sir, my pleasure. <laughs> We're speaking today during our global meeting of the International Red Cross Red Crescent Movement here in Geneva, Switzerland, mm -hmm. where you were just awarded the Henry Dunant Medal. The medal is named after the movement's founder and is also its highest honor. First of all, congratulations. Thank you. And please tell me, what does this honor mean to you? No, I, of course, I've known about this award for many years. I've seen it given to so many people. So I've never seen myself in that position. So when I was asked about it, I, um, uh, I said no. <laughs> no. You were surprised. I don't receive awards. So. But then um, my colleagues... Um, they uh, said something about this wasn't just for me, it was for Glow Red. <laughs> and then I said, I'll do it for them, for the women in the movement. Mm -hmm. And um, so I must say now it, feel, it felt really good in the ceremony. It mm -hmm. was a joyous moment, I think. Yes. Um, and uh, I hope that everyone felt that they had a piece of the award. <laughs> I can attest that it was a joyous moment. I could mm. feel it, and many people in the room felt it, especially women. I know we all applauded to what you had to say. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about what Glow Red is. Yes. So you've done many things over your career, as we've said, but one of the things you have really been known for, I would say, in recent years, is the drive to ensure gender equality and parity in decision-making roles, in leadership especially, within the IFRC network. I think it's fair to say that you perhaps saw a real problem and then you worked to resolve it. Yes, yes. So what was the problem? <laughs> that you would describe, mm. and how do you see the state of things today? Mm. You know, I came, as you mentioned already, I came back from uh, actually uh, a long period in the UN, um, 15 years almost in the UN, where there was, there was the period of really driving women's leadership and you know, bringing women into senior position and encouraging women. In the beginning, slow, but um, I think the two secretary generals were quite determined to make a change. So I came back to uh, the Red Cross and I came to the first General Assembly I attended in 2017. And we had already, with my colleague in Sweden, we had already decided that we would do something in itself unusual. We invited only women to a women's uh, lunch mingle. No men were allowed. <laughs> only that you can imagine. First time ever anyone came up with an idea like that. And we made sure we did it after the elections, so it wouldn't be sort of a campaign mm -hmm. issue because I was a candidate for the presidency at that time. And, uh, and I didn't win, of course, um, but um, it, it was a very interesting moment because we have a photo that is quite famous within our group of the entire General Assembly in Antalya. They are standing up. A ceremonial moment, the meeting is starting, and it's a sea of grey and black suits. 
and one red dot, which is the vice president of Turkish Red Crescent, then she was in red. And that photo is just... And a little bit later, we saw uh, at the end of the meeting, when the newly elected board and the president and the ICSC leadership lined up, there were like 25 men and three women. And I think, I think the entire room realized that there is something about it. I certainly did. And I walked out of the hall um, uh, after this, and I walked it was quite quickly. There was a colleague sitting there who I know for many years, a woman president. And I said, hello, how are you? <clears throat> and she looked at me blankly almost. She said, they should be ashamed. No, she said, we should be ashamed. How did we come to this situation? So, um, what do you do? <laughs> In that lunch mingle, we say we have to do something. And uh, since it's a conference, what do you do? You meet in the bar in the evening and you decide what to do. Then it's a conference, you write a resolution, <laughs> which you normally do six months in advance, not when the whole thing. So we said we'll write and we ask if we can table a resolution, a very short one that simply says, after all these decisions and plans of actions that we've been having since the 1970s, now National Societies Federation, ICSE, will commit to finally do something and report back. So the president accepted the resolution. Of course, it was big uh, happiness in the room. Um, but then you go home and you forget all about it. <laughs> and that's where the idea for Glow Red was somehow born because in my experience, it's a bit the same in the UN and these big membership organizations. Members come together, we're enthusiastic about our decisions, we go home and life takes its own path. Mm -hmm. So we discussed uh, with my colleagues there, we said, let's call around and see, should we start a network? And we drive this issue for change ourselves. We don't write, we don't write for civil servants or people to say, we'll do, no, we'll do it. Everyone was happy. We invited to a meeting in Stockholm early in 2018, and that's where Glow Red was born. There were about 25 senior women then. And uh, since we are a network, we don't have uh, money, we don't have offices, so we have to be simple and clear in our objective. So two things. We'll change the face of governance of the Federation, and we will build a pool of we'll, develop and support the pool of future women leaders. And we will be solid among us. We'll support women. We may not vote for them, but we support them to be candidates. And we will be disruptive. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, and you know what we did then, we just make sure we could go to every single meeting, we organized meetings, we organized governance training for senior women, we started all kinds of things and worked really hard. And uh, then uh, we actually had, which was I think s symptomatic of the situation. Um, we already then had a few women in the governing board of the Federation. They were also members of Gloria. So together with President Rocca, they took a very drastic decision to say we are not going to be able to break this unless we introduce a quota. So they got support, they made a proposal to General Assembly 2019 to introduce a quota system. Out of every five seats that every region has, two must be filled by women, two by men, and the fifth is up for grabs. So that's okay. Not everyone likes quotas, but it would certainly change. The, the problem was a bit that um, it was tougher than that because if you couldn't fill the two women positions, they will be left empty. And that's tough. Mm -hmm. And then the pandemic happened. <laughs> mm -hmm. We all went digital 
and you know how dramatic the situation was in many countries. So elections in 2022, I think many people forgot about these quotas. <laughs> and there wasn't much time for campaign. But even Was there so, any way to enforce the quotas? Yeah. I mean, if, if uh, they, because the assembly approved it, mm -hmm. to my surprise, I did not expect really that it would be. So they have, we had this and uh, it was a success because the new governing board came out with, uh, you know, just over 50% women members. So why did this happen so quickly? It really happened more quickly than I think was possible. And I think um, the atmosphere in the assembly in 2017 when we all this happened, my reading was this was like, you know, a f ripe fruit that was ready to fall. Mm -hmm. It just had to happen because they were like 20 years behind everybody else. And that's why I think once we started moving, table the issue, talking about it, mm -hmm. it very quickly gained momentum. That's where we are today. Three women presidents. Yes. Very, very good result, very quickly, like you said. But is this idea of mentoring and nurturing the next generation of female leaders something that you came to from experience? Did you have good mentors in your uh, early career? Or was this <laughs> lack of mentorship that bothered you so you wanted mm -hmm. to provide what you didn't have? I think, um, you know, in a way, I had mentors, yes, even though I, I'm sure, I, particularly when I was um, sort of a kid in my early teens, and I started going to libraries, and the librarians became my friends and things like uh -huh. that. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, we learned earlier that you were yeah. an avid reader. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, I think so, but I must also say that uh, in a way, I have not been very conscious about being a woman in mostly very male working places. I of, often get the question, how is it to be yes. a woman? And when I think back, I, I wasn't... Uh, I mean, eventually, and particularly when it was pointed out to me all the time, and women were coming to me with the issues, sort of, but... Um, so maybe it was being one if we had been more maybe there have been more effects of it so certainly we all have had mentors people that meant something for us mm -hmm. particularly those years when we are so easy to form beyond that um, it's not so easy necessarily to identify mm -hmm. because the role models for me then would have been men and uh, I, yes. you can't have them. So. <laughs> <laughs> would you say that when what you s started saying was that you didn't really think about you yourself being a woman in a man's world you just did what you did you just did what I did yes but do you think that's due to where you grew up because in some parts of the world, women are very aware that they're women and that certain doors are closed to them. Oh yes, it's very different. I, mean, I, I think uh, in that sense, I grew up in a very, uh, with a good family. You know, my father guided me in many ways to history and reading, etc. My mm -hmm. mother, like many mothers in those days, in in Sweden, uh, yes. as a society it was then, she said, well, if you really want to get married, you should do it, but first you must study and start working. So <laughs> that, that was the spirit of mm -hmm. the time, and mm -hmm. I, I appreciate it. I always wanted to go out in the world, and um, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do, but I wanted to go out in the world. Mm -hmm. So. So I, I think we were uh, we were probably the last enormously privileged generation, born just after the World War, growing economy, peace in the world almost. So socially uh, we were really privileged. 
but of course many many me women that I meet today they don't have the same far from the same mm -hmm. lived experience even people of my own generation and the younger ones so it's for them I think now for Anglo Red is so important in the yes. Red Cross and I, how they feel recognized and mm -hmm. given strength by the solidarity, the sisterhood and the slightly disruptive attitude we have to life. <laughs> How does one join Glow Red? Well, <laughs> in the beginning... Is it a formal network? Do you get well, yeah, a membership card or... No, not really, not anymore. In the beginning when we started, we thought we were going to uh, be quite selective. Mm -hmm. uh, but it turned out to be totally impossible because people wanted to join and they were young and they were this yes. and that. And we said, well, let everyone join. Sign up to the newsletter. We put you in the WhatsApp group. You are invited okay. to digital events and things. So mm -hmm. no, it's a free. And for there's all. a website, so people could look it up. Yes. Who are listening it's to us? There's a website with okay. material. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. We will actually we'll put in the notes for the podcast. We'll put a link to that. So, so women who are listening and watching yeah. us can can uh, join. Moving on to to just uh, speaking about the humanitarian sector a little bit. Um, the sector has always been characterized by a certain workaholic culture. People are really passionate about that wor their work and they also m often make great sacrifices mm -hmm. moving across the world. Um, how has this affected you and how do you think the nature of this work particularly impacts opportunities for women in mm -hmm. the sector? You know, it, uh, it is really a peculiar profession. <laughs> and uh, it can be very destructive for some personalities that, uh, you know, quite apart from sort of abuse, alcohol and drug, but just the people who are they get all the adrenaline and energy for moving from one catastrophe, one terrible situation to the next. And it's very hard to get them back to what their life was. So, I think in the, already in the 1990s, in the early, uh, after this, the big catastrophe with the Rwanda and all that in refugees, the war in former Yugoslavia, there was a massive recruitment of all kinds of people and mm -hmm. of course many of us realized these were not the people we re would have recruited if we had had more time and better system. Mm -hmm. So at that time we started a lot, and I say we not only Red Cross, also UN, humanitarians and others, we started becoming much more conscious about uh, sort of human resource management, taking care of people, due diligence, training, selection, making sure we didn't allow people to go from terrible job to the next without, you know, offering mm -hmm. psychological support, debriefing, etc. And um, so I think that has really improved, but we still <laughs> work alcoholic driven by passion. Um, but then the issue about how does it impact women and men and uh, when I was uh, at Ocha in New York and we started looking at senior women overall in the humanitarian sector but particularly at the field level and you know there's hardly any and we you know Determined to make a change, uh, really tried to recruit, promote, train, etc. Slight improvement is the same thing in the Red Cross, of course. ICRC has it, Federation has it. And uh, you detect that it, there's a big difference that men seem to be having a much easier deal to leave their family at home and go for a field mission 
that how many women can leave their children at home with the husband to go for a long field mission. Mm -hmm. And that dynamic has not changed. Mm -hmm. So the natural, sort of the natural life cycle of women you know, studying, starting to work, maybe getting married or having a partner, having children, is a disruption in the career. Mm -hmm. And um, the only way the organizations can keep them yes. is if we are uh, conscious and helpful, we welcome them back. Because mm -hmm. you cannot expect a woman with children going to the border between Chad and Sudan. Unless she can leave the children at home with the husband or family. And I, so I don't. I think we made. We are more conscious. We made progress. But really, breaking that dilemma, we haven't done yet. And I, I don't. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really work in progress. It's also. I mean, in a much wider issue, when uh, which we always must talk about when we talk about women's careers and the seat at the table and stepping forward. Do you want to yourself? Can you overcome your own internal barriers and mm -hmm. your self-questioning about, mm -hmm. can I do this? Mm -hmm. Women are so self-critical. Uh, so somewhere that plays in also in some uh -huh. of these careers in the humanitarian sector, I think. Is there something that men can do to change that dynamic? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, if we, we just had a, a red, a glow red mingle here. Uh -huh. And uh, one of the colleagues in the, in the Japanese Red Cross president, he is actually um, used to be the president of Keio University. He's a labor market economist. Uh -huh. And uh, he describes, which is very much true for uh, the Japanese labor market, but I think it's as true, is that there are many ways men can contribute to change. Uh, but one way is actually um, that if they give up a bit of their working time and do more at home, so women can work more. <laughs> There's a mathematical formula for this, <laughs> which he shares. But of course, also in this um, Mm -hmm. there is um, there is a traditional male aura of heroes around these jobs and men need to help to break that traditional classical perception that this is a kind of cowboy job mm -hmm. what do you think is the next step in in or phase in this um, maybe we can call it next level of diversity yeah. uh, is it socioeconomic is it more inclusive range of gender identity is it more linguistic diversity what kinds of diversity and inclusion should we think about today and in your view how can we address that to help everyone yeah. who comes from those diverse backgrounds i'm sure we can i, I think um some of it is, you know, really boring to say, but it really requires crystal clear human resource policies. And it requires leadership from the top, because if the top is wavering and not enforcing the internal mm -hmm. cultural rules, and uh, you also have to realize that, you know, if you're looking at the entire range of potential talents that you want to bring in you know people who are living with disability people who have not maybe physical disability but other disabilities but that are really interesting uh, talents the organization need to adjust and make space for them physical space you know social space mm -hmm. and and you need to have the courage to talk about it so that colleagues know, you know, what it is and how to relate to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
And I think organizations today are very capable to do that. But, um, you know, we, in, in my different jobs, we worked a lot with disability groups. And uh, I just met some of them a few weeks ago again and I uh, asked them how is progress on access and uh, yeah, 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 they said, sure, a little bit of progress, but not enough. So, uh, in the humanitarian sector, in the relief, uh, this is a specific issue because it's like we, we know, but we forget in the haste and speed of things. And that's why it's so important to have staff who themselves Yes, know can identify. what it means yes. when there is not a wheelchair, wheelchair ramp mm -hmm. and uh, when you don't have hearing aids, etc. So, so I think that's part of our, I would recommend more accelerated learning as organizations mm -hmm. as to go beyond theoretically knowing to actually making sure it happens. <laughs> making sure it happens, very important, yes. <laughs> rather than just talking about it, right? So besides the gender and diversity issues, you have also, as we mentioned, had uh, very senior roles and worked for many, many years in disaster risk reduction, but also in localization, effective localization. In this, I'm gonna call it, era of climate change, or perhaps getting more attention to it and other crises that we see around the world. What are some of the other key things that you personally are concerned about and are maybe working on? I would say that um, two, three things. And the first one I will not talk much about, I will just say it the quality and integrity of leadership as a key to you know, making change. But then also the experience on disaster risk reduction, climate change issues, I think the, it's, it's the, the, the gap between the enormous knowledge that we have and how little or how limited the use is that people who take decisions can use it for. And it's, that's not really a translation issue, but it's an issue of how to present and communicate good science and good evidence mm -hmm. so that, you know, your municipal decision maker who is pressed for time, pressed for money, you can't tell him or her to sit and look for this in his computer. You have to be able to show them the options here, the optional consequences of your choices. Uh, how much flooding can your, uh, your municipality stand? What does it cost to prevent it, to at least make sure it's not too bad? And that gap, you know, I, and I'm not, <laughs> fortunately, I'm not the only one worrying about mm -hmm. it, but I would really like to see that one becoming so much more efficient because it would help us all to deal with re mitigating and reducing risks. Having worked in, in the humanitarian sector for so long and seeing everything that's happening right now, what actually keeps you going, gives you hope, inspires you, despite of everything? Because you seem to be a very positive, optimistic person. Yeah, you know, I, I think, but, you know, I also say the people who are working in this sector and this business, we are optimists. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we wouldn't keep doing all the things we do. It sort of comes with the, with the trade almost, but... Uh, you know, I'm really inspired by people, and I um, pick up ideas wherever I go, I try to transfer them to others. But as you say, it's really big issues we are dealing, we are faced with now. It's not, it's not something that is solvable in a way, but 
one gentleman, we were talking about earthquakes in the Himalayas. And, uh, you know, glacier lakes that break and rush away flooding. And he said, um, remember that we are talking about risk reduction. We are not talking about eliminating risk. And, and I think that's really key. Mm -hmm. uh, we must not talk about risk and disasters as if we can make them disappear forever. That's not the objective. The objective is that we learn how to live much more with nature, not against it, but we also take seriously risk mitigation. And I don't think we take it seriously enough. It's like, you know, one day you're really aware of it, and next day you go to the movies and enjoy your dreams, something like that. And we have to do that in a way, we humans. But the consistency of investment, of determination on the plan, which has a clear goal of reducing long-term risk and equipping people to deal with them, I think really is key. And uh, also because today there is such a mix of risks. We have this mm -hmm. sense by many that conflicts may actually spread, that we are in for a long period of spreading conflicts globally. And mixing that with other areas. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I, I can sense that there is a difficulty of distinguishing one from the other, but also an inability to realize the consequences of it all happening in the same space and time space. So, I think it takes courage to talk and think about that, and mm -hmm. I'm not so sure people are so comfortable in talking about it, <laughs> but I wish they were. And that's a big thing for the Red Cross. The name of this podcast is People in the Red Vest. Yes. <laughs> it's symbolic because as you know, not everyone in the network uh, wears a red vest, but some kind of uniform, nevertheless. So what does the red vest mean to you? Yeah, it's true. Some have blue vests, actually. Yes, <laughs> it's blue and white and orange, I think. Yes. Yeah. I wish they all had red vests because that's the... But for me, I was thinking about that question since you sent me the, the questions, and I think it's a, in one way it's a comfort. You know, it means that there are people out there who are ready to support you if you need. It's also an opportunity because you could become like them. You know, if you feel that this is something I'd like to do, I could become one of them. So it's something really positive, and I, I know it's positive even in places where people don't really know about the Red Cross very much, but they know these people in Red West. Of mm -hmm. I think today also there is a worry, because with all these attacks on volunteers in some of the conflict zones, we are no longer protected the way we expected them to be, and that's a sadness. And you have to admire the courage of people that just keep going. So it's that very positive thing. And then it's this, you know, be careful, please. <laughs> Absolutely. And staff and volunteers, all humanitarians, absolutely should be protected. Yes. Yeah. So thank you. Margareta, it's been a real honor and a pleasure to meet you today in person. Thank and thank you for finding the time to speak with us, share your experiences and insights, and for allowing us to get to know you a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>